Hello and welcome to lecture 6 of our awesome course Computational Physics, Physics 352 at Northwestern. And I'm your awesome instructor Sasha Chikovskoy. And today we're going to talk about radioactive decay of multiple species. And first, let me start with a few reminders. Assignment 2 is due one minute before midnight today, uh, February 2nd. And today, we are also going to be doing cool things. We're going to start with the radioactive decay of two species. That is, we're going to do problems 1.4 and 1.5 uh, from our computational physics book. Uh, we're going to continue to work on the projectiles. Uh, that is, things that you send in the air. And uh, we're going to wrap it up with uh, the basic harmonic oscillator. So what did we do last time? Uh, we introduced uh, a runge cutter approach, which is uh, a, a more general class of uh, ways of solving uh, ordinary differential equations in an explicit way. So Euler method is a, uh, is a simpler version than RK. RK is typically higher order, and Euler is basically RK of order 1. Uh, so uh, what we did is we start with a problem uh, that was a continuous ODE and we restated it uh, in the terms of a, a, an expansion, Taylor expansion. So uh, the value at the new time, t plus delta t, where delta t is a time step, uh, is the value at the current time, t uh, plus the linear term, uh, the derivative times the time step, plus the quadratic term, uh, one half of the second derivative uh, times the square of the time step, and so on and so forth. Uh, we can continue the stellar expansion to higher and higher powers of delta t. Euler approximation cuts off this expansion uh, at the first term, so we only retain the linear term and drop everything else. What does Runge-Cutter do? It retains essentially higher order terms. Uh, so in this case, we are looking at fourth order runge cutter. And so what it does, it kind of dances around, uh, takes a step forward, step back, step forward, step back, kind of feels the curvature of our function. And after it uh, kind of tumbled around for a while, uh, it then um, combines all of those tri trial steps forward uh, into one very firm uh, and very um, definitive step. Uh, forward that will actually have a fourth uh, order error. So let's kind of remind ourselves uh, how these steps work. Uh, first we're going to take a step forward uh, with the derivative uh, with the slope in time uh, defined at that uh, original time. So then we're going to take one half of the full time step because we really want to get over here uh, from t0 to t1 but we're going to take half a step forward uh, we're going to value the derivative over here and we're going to go forward in time with that derivative. Then we're going to evaluate the derivative at this new point and we're going to go with this new derivative all the way out there. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to combine the values of functions all these, all these, this, all of these points, see all of these uh, right-hand sides, we're going to evaluate them together and uh, uh, we're going to uh, basically weigh them with various ways that add up to unity and we're going to take a step forward, full step forward um, over the entire delta t uh, time step, but with uh, the slope that is the weighted sum, uh, weighted average of all of these uh, different slopes that we have measured over here. So that is uh, what Rene Kata does. Uh, if you're interested in figuring out why that's actually giving you a high accuracy solution, please uh, send me a note or ask me a question. I'm happy to explain how uh, to test this. But suffice it to say is that if you expand this function to high order and uh, uh, perform all of the steps forward in time and then uh, perform uh, this weighted average, then you will find that within the Taylor expansion, all of the low order terms will cancel out and you're going to be ending up with the fourth order method. So let's take a look at a general Euler solver that we looked at last time. Uh, what the solver does, uh, it accepts the uh, right-hand side part uh, that gives us the acceleration essentially. Uh, that is, uh, uh, this right-hand side part will depend on the current uh, value of x, uh, on the current value of time, and it will take an array of parameters. So 
this is our function uh, order solver where we give it a uh, array of solutions uh, array of times and uh, we give it the right hand side part which is a function right it accepts uh, the value of x the value of time and uh, the value uh, of uh, an, an address which is an address of an array with a bunch of these parameters uh, then it uh, accepts the, uh, <laughs> the same array of parameters uh, the time step delta t as well as the number of time steps you would like to take it you would like to, to take so then of course not surprisingly after it knows how many after it uh, figured out how many time steps you want to take it as you told it so uh, it's going to loop uh, over that many time steps uh, it's going to evaluate the right hand side part essentially the force uh, and uh, uh, then it will uh, print out the value just for us to know what's going on and uh, it will take one step forward uh, making a call to order step that is a function that uh, takes this uh, linear approximation uh, to our equations and takes one uh, time step delta t and it will of course update uh, the time as well by adding delta t to that and this is the right hand side part here so in this case the role of the force in our uh, equation uh, is played uh, by the uh, nuclear decay so it tells us what is the derivative uh, in time of uh, the number of uh, radioactive, um, radioactive elements that are left over uh, and uh, so this basically tells us the decay rate uh, of them uh, so how do we call this here is an example uh, we uh, are planning to take uh, 100 steps and uh, uh, this is our array that holds the solution. This is our array that holds the times. Uh, we are going to choose the time step which is much smaller than the characteristic time scale, uh, which is set over here, uh, which is uh, the half lifetime. It's one, and so our time step is much smaller than, than the characteristic lifetime, right? Uh, and then uh, we initialize our uh, solution uh, with the uh, uh, the initial number of radioactive elements uh, it's a hundred uh, the initial time is zero why not start uh, from zero and then we're going to call our solver to which we're going to give the arrays uh, of the um, the concentration of the um, radioactive elements uh, the uh, array of the times the right hand side part uh, which tells us how fast the decay will happen uh, and then the parameters, in this case just uh, the half lifetime. Uh, finally, we give it uh, the uh, time step that we would like to use and uh, the number of time steps we'd like it to take. And after we have uh, obtained the solution here, or the solver gives us the solution, right, populates the values of n and t uh, right here, we're going to print out the contents of the n and the t arrays. So uh, big deal, we're done with solving the radioactive decay using the Euler method. So let's try and make things a little bit complicated. Let's change things up, uh, make them more exciting. So instead of considering just one species, we're going to consider two species. And uh, one of them will decay into the other. So of course, the first species, the A species, uh, follows the same exact ordinary, ordinary differential equation, uh, right? Uh, its rate of decay is proportional to the number of uh, elements that are still remaining uh, divided by the half lifetime with of course the minus sign because uh, the number of elements uh, is going to be decreasing there is nowhere for us to replenish them they just decay uh, over this sort of time scale uh, t uh, tau a and uh, the uh, the b species is uh, going to be the product of the decay of the A species. So whatever uh, we lost in A species is whatever uh, species B will gain. So if we had uh, the right-hand side negative for the A species, we're going to have exactly the same uh, right-hand side here, but with the opposite sign, because whatever species A lose is what species B gaining. Uh, and of course, species B itself is going to be radioactively decaying uh, with a half lifetime tau B. So we're going to have the right hand side part, uh, which is uh, the same as for species A, but uh, of course, uh, with the A subscript replaced with B, because species B decays in the same exact physical way as species A, just with different uh, parameter uh, tau B instead of tau A. And of course, we need to plug in 
the number of species B remaining uh, because that's what controls uh, the rate of decay of species B. So let's actually change things up even more. Let's take it, make it more exciting. Suppose that species B decays into A. So if we have the sort of cycle where a species uh, A decays into B and B decays into A, and uh, each of them has its own lifetime, uh, then this is becoming more interesting because both of the equations are coupled. You cannot solve one without solving the other. Uh, because previously we could solve this equation, figure out what the solution for A was, plug it in here, and then solve the equation for B. Now we cannot do that. Uh, one equation depends on the other, the other one depends on the first one. So let us discretize both of these equations at the same time. So this is how the discretization looks like, and how uh, do we get that? Well, uh, we're going to replace Na uh, with Na plus 1 minus Nai. Uh, so that is going to approximate the increment in n or the derivative in n. We're going to multiply both sides by delta t, so we will replace dt with delta t, and then we're going to get precisely this equation. Similarly, we're going to be able to obtain uh, a discretized version of uh, the second equation uh, that will take this form. Let me know if it's not clear. And of course, here we are taking the simplest uh, numerical method, the Euler method, uh, the second order uh, local truncation error or first order global truncation error method. So uh, in order to keep track of two species at the same time we're going to have to upgrade our method to be able to handle those two species instead of one. And so one way of doing that is instead of representing each solution as a one-dimensional array of doubles or floats we're going to represent the solution as a one-dimensional array of structures. Each structure contains two uh, doubles, uh, the concentration of species A and the concentration of species B. And we're going to call the structure two species. And so now we will be able to solve the system in exactly the same way as we solved a single ordinary differential equation. It's just we're going to be operating on a vector, essentially, what the structure represents, a vector. So uh, these are the declarations of the uh, functions that now operate on this uh, vector, uh, two species. We're going to uh, rename the function uh, or name the new function uh, with the suffix two species. Now, instead of taking just an array, 1D array of uh, floating point numbers, it takes an array of two species instances of that structure. Uh, it still takes a one-dimensional array of times because time is still a scalar. Uh, and now it takes uh, two uh, values to the right-hand side, f, fa and fb, which tell us the decay rate of each of the species. And of course, we need to give uh, the time step delta t that we would like the Euler uh, step uh, function to take. So uh, then we're going to be able to call this Euler step function for two species in a loop in order to give us uh, the one-dimensional uh, array of the solution. And uh, for that, just like we did for one single species, uh, we're going to upgrade uh, the one-dimensional array to a, uh, an array of uh, two, uh, an array of vectors. So each instance will be uh, holding two concentrations, uh, an instance of a structure two species. And now we're going to have to give to the Euler solver uh, two function pointers. Uh, the uh, first one is telling us how fast the first species decays. It's giving us the right-hand side for the first equation. And this one is giving us the right-hand side for the second equation. So in some sense, you can think of it as a, as a vector uh, representing the right-hand side, right? Uh, there are two dimensions to this vector. Uh, the first one for the first species and the second one for the second species, for species A and species B. Uh, of course, we're going to take the parameters that control the decay rates of these species. Now we're going to have two parameters, tau A and tau B. Uh, we're still needing the time step and the number of time steps that we would like to take. So these are the solutions. Uh, so this is the concentration uh, as a function of time uh, and uh, uh, here we've chosen uh, the tau A values and tau B values to be the same. And so you can see that species A decays uh, and species B gains, and then they end up in equilibrium, right? Because the system is symmetric. There is no other way for us to end up. 
because species A decays in species B at the same rate as species B decays in species A. And so we can uh, uh, solve this uh, system of coupled ODs uh, using various solvers, Euler, RK2, RK4, uh, and uh, uh, we can do it for both species A and species B. This is why there are six different symbols. Uh, and you can see all of them are on top of each other so that all of our methods are doing a good enough job, at least by eye, they're doing a good enough job. We can, of course, plot the analytical solution uh, for each of these. Uh, and uh, you can actually go back and figure out what the analytical solution here would be. Try to think about how to make use of the symmetry of the system uh, for the case when tau A is equal to tau B and how to solve uh, the system analytically, how to reduce it actually to a single uh, analytical OD. Um, suffice it to say that there is a solution and we can, analytical solution, and we would like, we will actually be able to compare uh, the uh, results that we obtain numerically against the analytical results. And here we show the plot of the difference uh, between the numerical and analytical result as a function of time. Uh, I'm showing this uh, on, on a linear scale. Uh, in practice, it actually might be more useful to plot this on a log scale, but let's uh, stick with linear for now for simplicity. And you can see that the first order Euler method actually has a much higher error than the second or fourth order Arrhenius cutter method. Uh, so you see that on the same scale, at least linear scale, uh, the errors for Arrhenius cutter uh, are much smaller. They're not zero. Uh, this is a bit misleading. The linear scale is a bit misleading. They actually are just much smaller, maybe uh, an order or two orders of magnitude smaller uh, than uh, the Euler method. And we will actually look uh, later at how different the errors are for different orders of the method. Uh, let us, before that, uh, take a look at another exciting problem, that is projectile launched into the air. Uh, let us first ignore the effects of the air and just focus on the effects of gravity. And uh, we're going to consider two-dimensional motion of the projectile in the x-y plane. So we're going to have x going to the right and y going up. So uh, the motion in the x direction will be given by uh, this equation, second derivative of x with respect to time is zero. Why it's zero? Well, because gravity points down, and so there is no uh, force that uh, will uh, be changing uh, the velocity of the projectile in the x direction. And so what this is telling us is essentially that dvx dt is equal to zero. There is no acceleration in the x direction. Uh, acceleration is the second derivative of coordinate with respect to time. However, in the vertical direction, gravity is pulling down, and so there is gravitational acceleration. And so you can see that gravitational acceleration, uh, which is given by g, it's pointing down, uh, so that, that's why there is a minus sign, and d2y dt squared, that is the definition of acceleration expressed in terms of the coordinate. And so that is what the equation represents, that the vertical acceleration is given to us by gravity. We can uh, try and translate the second order equation into a first order set of ordinary differential equations because we don't know how to solve second order equations. We have so far looked only at first order ordinary differential equations. And so we can break uh, up the second order OD into two first order ODs uh, by introducing the velocity as a new variable. Right? dx dt is v in the x direction, vx, and the derivative of vx with respect to time, dvx dt, is going to be zero. These two equations are equivalent to that single equation. And it's much easier for us to solve these equations because we know how to do that. We already have a solver for two species. Right? You can think of it as species 1, uh, x, and uh, you can think of vx as species 2. Uh, there is really nothing that... Uh, in, there's nothing about these equations that tell us that it have, they have to be specifically describing radioactive decay. They can describe anything else, in this case, the particle motion. Uh, also, we can uh, do similar uh, transition from second order to first order ODs, coupled ODs, for the motion in the y direction, except now we're going to actually have a non-zero right-hand side because we have the gravitational acceleration. The y component of velocity is not going to be constant. Uh, it's going to be um, uh, increasing in the minus and negative direction 
uh, because of the action of gravity. But what's beautiful here is you see that the x and the y coordinates are actually independent. So you can solve an ODE um, that describes the x motion and the y motion. Uh, these ODEs, you can solve them independently. And uh, uh, for that, uh, we will introduce uh, the right-hand side. So there will be f, x, and f, y. And here we're going to have f, x, and f, y with a subscript v. So these are the right-hand sides for the velocity equations. So then because we can separate out the two equations for x and y, we can solve them with our regular Euler method or RK2 or RK4 uh, for two species. So our x uh, will be uh, discretized using the regular Euler method and our v will be discretized, well in this case it will be trivial, just v doesn't change in the x direction, but the y direction is more interesting, right? The y coordinate is going to be linear in velocity and uh, the y velocity will be linear in acceleration. So in order to solve these equations, uh, as I said, we can use exactly the same machinery that we developed for radioactive decay of two species. So when there is no drag, when there is no resistance of the air, uh, then uh, uh, the two uh, different dimensions, the x and the y dimensions, are independent. And uh, therefore, we can uh, use our two species solver to solve for the x motion by setting Na equal to x and Nb equal to Vx. So you will have to have uh, two arrays of structures to store the full two-dimensional motion because you will have to do exactly the same thing for the y dimension. And as before, all of the physics that controls the physical system is hiding inside of the right-hand side part, or the f functions. They tell us uh, whether there is acceleration uh, in the x direction. Um, and because f in the x direction is zero, that means that there will be none. And uh, similarly, it tells us that there is acceleration in the y direction. Uh, and uh, that is what's basically forcing the projectile to fall back down uh, towards the surface, surface of the Earth. So uh, the other important thing that uh, uh, we're going to talk about now is how to automate uh, running a code for a bunch of different parameters, because sure enough, we would like to investigate uh, how the trajectories of our projectiles uh, that are launched from the surface of the Earth will change their shape depending on the angle at which we're going to launch the projectiles and the velocities. So in order to do that, we don't want to run our software manually a hundred different times. We would like to sweep through uh, the values of velocity, sweep through the values of angles. And uh, we don't necessarily want to do so inside of our code, uh, inside of our C code. We can do the sweep externally and we can use bash scripting for that. So let me give you a quick example of how that would work. Um, in order to do that, we would like to be able to pass uh, the values of velocity and the angle as arguments. In our case, uh, we're going to pass the components of velocity, vx and vy, we, vy as uh, the command line arguments to our main function we will need to convert these arguments into from strings into doubles. For that, we're going to use a standard library function for converting strings into floating point values, in this case doubles. Uh, it is strict to d function, and you can look up its manual uh, by typing man strict to d. Uh, stands for string to double. And uh, this is the manual uh, it gives you the names of the functions it's covering here, and it's covering a bunch of different functions for different floating types. As you can see, strict to f uh, and strict to d are sitting here, plus there is also strict to ld, lawn double. So these are the three function declarations, uh, and it describes what these functions uh, do for you. 
So example of uh, how to use this function uh, is here. If you want to convert the first argument, uh, rgv1, uh, from the string to the double, you do this. You call str2d, give it argument one, and pass the second one uh, as null, because uh, uh, the second argument is actually going to return the address of the uh, character that is immediately after the number that you asked it to read. Uh, this can be really useful if you would like to um, continue processing the string after you've read in the double uh, value, but we aren't going to be doing this here because we're only interested in reading the double and abandoning the rest of the string. I don't really care about that here. So the parameters uh, that we care about for this problem is the gravitational acceleration, and so it will be just one parameter, uh, g, which is equal to 9.8 meters um, per sec second squared. So we will automate the whole thing, as I, as I mentioned, by using bash scripting. So here is an example of the script. Uh, here is the address on the Quest supercomputer. Uh, and here is uh, the script itself. So uh, what we're going to do initially is remember, tell uh, the shell, um, uh, tell the operating system which shell we're going to be using. And uh, now we're going to specify the uh, initial value of our velocity. Uh, we're going to specify a range of values that we're going to sweep through. Uh, and uh, then we're going to use a trick to compute the value of pi uh, right here. Um, we are doing that by making a call uh, to a bc uh, command line function, uh, which uh, allows you to specify the accuracy to which you want to evaluate uh, the functions that you're calling. And then you can give it a mathematical expression, in this case, four times the arctangent of one. Arctangent of one is going to be pi over four. A multiply pi over four by four is going to give you pi. So that's why it's going to be pi. Similarly, here we're going to loop uh, over our angles. So for values of a angle in the range of angles right here, uh, we're going to perform this loop. Uh, we're going to compute vx. Uh, as v times cosine uh, of the angle uh, in radians. We're going from degrees to radians. And here we're going to do the same thing for vy. So these two, c and s, are the cosine and the sine functions, uh, as, as I say right here. Finally, we're going to call uh, different uh, executables for projectile evolution without any drag. Uh, and then there will be projectile with the drag of the air, and there will be projectile with the drag and the altitude effects included, uh, the vertical stratification of atmosphere. Uh, that's what I mean here. We're going to get to all of them uh, later. So check this out. Uh, this is really handy. It's really handy for your research uh, if you would like to explore the parameter space uh, of whatever problem you're considering. Uh, super, super useful. It also could be useful for a re to rename a bunch of files. Let's say you've generated a movie and you would like to, uh, let's say, uh, take every 10th file uh, and uh, en enumerate them sequentially because you would like to make a movie that's uh, 10 times faster with 10 times higher frame rate. So then you can loop over every 10th file and rename each of them in a sequential order. So that is something that I do all the time when I'm playing around with the movies in order to make them for my talks. So uh, super useful tool, uh, check it out, and uh, I'm hoping that it will uh, take its place in your daily routine. So here are the fun things that we're going to do uh, now that we have this tool, and we can run it for a bunch of different initial conditions. So by varying the angle, keeping the velocity the same, uh, we can uh, compare uh, what we get uh, against uh, what the book gets. And you see that there is really good agreement uh, between the trajectory shapes. So this is a comparison to figure 2.4, the left panel of it. And I forgot to mention that you run this uh, uh, script, you either type it, uh, type dot slash script, but then you need to make it executable. And if you don't want to make it executable, you can uh, use the source command uh, followed by this script file name. 
Uh, so this is plotting done with GNU plot. If you want a prettier plot, you can go ahead and do exactly the same thing uh, with Python. I'm going to uh, leave it to you to try it out and see how it looks like. So how do we add the drag? Well, we will have to switch from two species to four species approach because now we will have four independent ODEs, two for the X direction and another two for the Y direction, and they all are a couple. So how does it look like? Well, we will replace all of the structures that held two different values with uh, four different values. So our vectors will go from two to four dimensions. And uh, now our four variables will be X and Y, and uh, Vx and Vy. These are the four variables. And as you can see, all of these equations are coupled to each other. Now, uh, the uh, oh, and, and the biggest difference is, of course, the addition of this term uh, here and here in the velocity uh, equation that is coupling the Vy and Vx together through the velocity uh, where Vx and Vy enter. And so now when we solve this uh, system of four ODEs, we're going to find uh, the updated trajectories and uh, you can compare what we find uh, with uh, uh, the uh, solutions shown in the book. And you can see that, yes, uh, the overall behavior of these solutions is comparable. And you can see that because of the air drag, the trajectories don't go up as high or as far as before. We can also take into account the effect of vertical stratification in the atmosphere. Uh, that's uh, because the density uh, depends on the height or the altitude above the ground. And so if we assume uh, an uh, adiabatic approximation, uh, we are going to be able to express the density as a function of the altitude uh, that will be parameterized by two parameters, the alpha, uh, the alpha and the A parameters. And the drag that the projectile experiences will of course be proportional to the density. So uh, our expression for the drag will be scaled by the density in units of the original density, uh, multiplying the original drag expression that didn't have the dependence uh, of, of density of the atmosphere on the height that didn't have stratification. So just to reiterate, this is the force of the drag that takes into account the non-uniformity of the vertical stratification of the atmosphere, and this one is the one that does not. And this prefactor rho over rho zero is uh, converting one to the other. And of course, uh, both of them are going to be uh, given by minus rho over zero uh, times b2 times v times v as a vector. So uh, these uh, difficult to see signs here uh, are the vector signs above v, above f, and above f over there. So we can now include the vertical stratification and see how the results change. And uh, clearly you see that uh, the uh, solutions in uh, uh, our approach and in the book are consistent uh, with each other. And uh, these are the parameters uh, for which the solutions are computed. Now there are five parameters in addition to Vx and Vy, uh, or in addition to the magnitude of velocity and the angle. Uh, there are also uh, the uh, values of uh, alpha and uh, uh, a and alpha, as well as the temperature at the base of the atmosphere. So uh, one, two, three, uh, four, and five. Now let's try and switch gears and have more fun. Uh, instead of sending projectiles uh, essentially into space, we now are going to go back into the lab and take a look at the equations that describe a simple harmonic oscillator. 
Uh, of course, the equations here are going to be nonlinear if you displace the oscillator away too far from the equilibrium, but let us assume a small angle approximation which will linearize our uh, ODE uh, so that uh, the equation is linear in theta. Uh, so here, of course, G is still gravity and L is the distance uh, between our mass uh, and the point of attachment. So we can take the second order differential equation and we're going to use the same trick by splitting it up into two first order differential equations. So the first one will be d theta dt, uh, is going to give us the angular frequency omega, and then d omega dt is going to give us the acceleration uh, from here. So all we've done is we've really kind of separated out the two derivatives uh, from each other by introducing a new uh, variable, the angular frequency. And so the seemingly innocent change now allows us to solve the system uh, using uh, our machinery that we've developed, we've developed for first order ODEs. So as before, we can discretize these ODEs using the Euler method, uh, where uh, d omega dt, if we collect them on one side, is going to give us the right hand side. And of course, d theta uh, dt is going to give us uh, is going to give us omega. And here, of course, there is a typo. Uh, this sign should be a plus sign because uh, it is really the time derivative of theta that will be formed on, on the left hand side if we divide both sides by uh, delta t after moving theta i to the left. Uh, and you see that on the right we should have omega i instead of minus omega i. So that's definitely typo. Apologize for that. So now you see that this is a system of two ODs. Uh, we have two independent variables. And so we can use the two species solver uh, to attack this problem. You don't really have to change anything about your solver. Uh, all you need to do is uh, link your new main function against the library that you already created as part of the problem set. And of course, uh, you don't have to rename the variables inside of the, your library. You just treat uh, the concentration of species A as the theta variable and concentration of species B as the omega uh, variable. But once we approach this problem and look at the result, you will see that it behaves in a really weird way. The magnitude of oscillation keeps increasing in time, which seems absurd. It's unphysical uh, because we know that the solution to a simple harmonic oscillator uh, is a sinusoid uh, with a constant magnitude, not the one that changes with time. And this is a sign that something has really gone wrong here. Uh, there is nothing that pumps the uh, energy into our system. Um, so what we're seeing here is an unphysical behavior. It's an indication that the Euler method is actually unstable. It has always been unstable, even for the, um, even for the projectiles. But because uh, we didn't integrate for too long, the error uh, accumulated as a result was not too large. Whereas here, uh, you can notice this error uh, much more clearly because uh, the system is periodic so it needs to come back to the same place and it doesn't and that accentuates uh, the error. So kind of the background why this error is happening is the Euler method has a first order uh, global truncation error and so the error goes as delta t to the first power. The error is proportional to delta t and so it's much better if your error scales as a higher power of delta t than one. Uh, and uh, then the error shrinks faster uh, than uh, um, uh, relative to time of interest. And so uh, these are the different methods that allow you to do that. Uh, for instance, Euler-Cromer method that is discussed in, uh, in our textbook or rangi kata of the second or fourth order. So if you solve the same problem using rangi kata four, you will find that the behavior, the physical behavior comes back. Uh, and so we can declare victory over here. So what if we now uh, try and uh, include the friction? Because in reality, there will be some friction in the oscillator. And so what we're going to do is we're going to add a force that is proportional to the velocity. So it's uh, um, some sort of dissipation that we're introducing over here. 
And as before, we can separate the second order ODE into two different ODEs, just like before. We, the first one uh, defines the angular frequency, and the second one uh, gets this little modification uh, from uh, the drag force. The resulting finite difference equations uh, also get this extra term. As you see, there is no more typo in here. Uh, the sign is, the, is positive over here. Uh, and uh, now we can plot the results in equations and you can see that, of course, in the presence of, uh, of friction, if you look at the amplitude of oscillations over time, they go down to zero. The energy eventually gets dissipated and the amplitude that started to be uh, like that eventually uh, shrinks down to essentially zero. So, what else we can do? We can try and add a periodic driving force in time. We're going to pump energy in the system uh, to try and see if the system approaches a steady state. A uh, system loses energy because of the drag force or the friction force, but we keep pumping energy by shaking the system with uh, a um, amplitude FD, that's the amplitude of the driving force, and the frequency omega D that is the angular frequency of the driving force. So basically we come into our oscillator and start shaking it violently uh, with uh, that frequency and that amplitude. So what will happen now? How will the system uh, choose between what it wants to do and what we want uh, it to do by shaking it? So as before, the equations are going to be uh, looking pretty similar, except they're going to get this extra term, the driving term. And uh, once we uh, discretize them in the finite different form, finite difference form, uh, we will get that term uh, just multiplied by delta t. So now what you see is the initial fluctuations are trying to get damped, but very soon thereafter, the uh, external driving force takes over and you are getting a kind of steady state oscillatory solution uh, that is occurring at a frequency that is determined by the driving force. One other cool thing that we can do is we can uh, remember that our uh, oscillator was actually nonlinear because the force that pulled it down or the component of the force in the direction uh, that was pulling it down to the equilibrium uh, position actually was proportional not to theta but to sine theta. It's only in the limit of small values of theta that sine theta could be replaced with theta, and that was the linearization, as, as it's called. Uh, that's the linearization that we performed. So if we uh, reconstitute the full nonlinear behavior of the system here by plugging in the sine, uh, the system itself won't change much, except that now theta will be replaced with sine theta, but otherwise things stay the same. And similarly, in the finite difference form, uh, our theta I will be replaced with sine theta i. But the physical behavior will be qualitatively different. So if we start with a, a, um, an oscillator that we will uh, deviate from the, uh, from the equilibrium by angle of pi over 2, it looks pretty much the same. It looks like it is uh, a sinusoid. Although if you compare it to the a linear approximation, you will find differences because sine of pi over 2 is not pi over 2, it is 1. So there are already quantitative differences. But on a qualitative level, the differences become particularly pronounced if you start the oscillator with an angle of 3, uh, three radians. So instead of the oscillator hanging down, we are going to take it almost all the way upside down, but not quite, and we're going to let it go. And because it is very close to the unstable vertical equilibrium, right? Because uh, um, you know, if you if you take uh, a pencil and try to put it on its head, it will fall. Similarly, the oscillator that is in the vertical position, uh, pointing up, is not going to be stable. So eventually, it will fall. But it takes some time. So you see, there is this flattening uh, at the extrema, and that is due to the nonlinear behavior of the system. It's because sine. Uh, is not theta, uh, it is uh, going to vanish near the top, and so that's why it will take a while for our system to get out of that unstable equilibrium. Uh, so what can also happen here, and we're going to be focusing on that 
in uh, the next lecture is the pendulum doesn't have to stop uh, at the vertical position, it can keep swinging. So if you give it a substantial, quick, uh, substantial kick, the pendulum can rotate all the way through, can uh, swing all the way around. And that is uh, going to lead to chaos, as we will see uh, later. So for large displacements over here, if we uh, create a huge amplitude of oscillations, uh, the pendulum spends more time at uh, near the equilibrium points or near uh, the uh, turning points. This is it for today. Uh, as I advertised already, next thing on our plate is chaos, chaotic systems, and that is when you change the initial condition just a little bit and everything downhill changes. So that's a really exciting phenomenon and we're going to see it in action and we're going to be able to simulate that on your laptops. Super, super exciting developments. And I'm going to see you at the office hours uh, in just a few hours. Have a good one.